so hello everybody. Um, the title of my talk is Socio-Technical Transitions, Political Economy and Examples from South Africa. Um, and what I'm drawing from in my talk is first of all my, my academic and professional background in development. And then as a, as a, from a theoretical perspective um, in my academic research, my attempts to bring together um, perspectives from political economy and socio-technical transitions. And then to provide some examples from the, the extensive research I've done specifically in relation to, to South Africa. So that's where I'm coming from with this talk. And I wanted to start with a quote from a Nigerian author um, who in a, in a recent TED talk um, about perspectives on Africa warned against the danger of the single story. Um, and what she said was, the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. Incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And I suppose I'm, I'm saying this because um, from my experience, uh, narratives on, um, on Africa, um, perspectives on, on transitions in Africa also often get reduced to a single story. Um, and I, I, for this reason, it, whilst this may be uh, rather patronising to a lot of you to say Africa is a continent, I feel it's important to, um, to bring home this point because it often gets reduced to um, a, much, a much smaller and a much more homogenous experience than the very diversity that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about sustainability transitions. Um, so, for example, it's the world's second largest and most populous continent. There are approximately 2,000 languages, 54 countries, and the nature of, of Africa's states draw heavily from a colonial history um, created by colonial powers that have little or no knowledge of, of ethnic, political, or geographical realities. And this in turn has had an influence over the way in which um, energy pathways, infrastructural and industrial pathways have taken place. Um, and I, I'm drawing from a, um, a book that was written about South Africa's minerals energy complex by Barney Marsinji, who just after the end of apartheid detailed how um, the electricity sector was set up to serve an accumulation strategy based on, on heavy industry. Um, and racial inequality. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah. So, does that mean that nobody heard? Do I have to then start again? again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'm saying this because I think that when one is thinking about sustainability transitions, it's important to bear national context and historical context in mind. Um, and context counts. And so, to draw from a, a, a theoretical perspective from a colleague of mine called Adrian Smith and various other people. They argued that when you're thinking about um, innovation systems, when you're thinking about the process of system innovation, more attention should be given to the context in which regime transformation arises, in terms of the peculiarities of incumbent regimes and the specific features of its governance structure. Um, this is essential as both will influence the way in which the process of system innovation could take place. And I've included this quotation here because I think it poses a useful challenge and a useful reality check on policy approaches that, that without necessarily wanting to be, end up being technocratic approaches which fail to integrate nationally specific path dependencies. Um, so re referring back to, to Chiramanda and Gozi Adichie, um, I've adapted what she says to warn against the danger of the single policy narrative and I think we often see this in, in, in from transitions perspectives which can then result in a, an over simplistic assumption of scale up and replicability so just because a certain policy worked in one country doesn't necessarily mean it will work in the same way in another. Sure there may be, there may be comparisons there'll definitely be lessons learned there'll be um, cross, cross country learning but um, the notion that one policy or one technology can be translated nice and simply, I think, um, is, is a problematic assumption. Um, the single policy narrative, I think, also makes false assumptions about the linearity of policy, rather than as policy being a long-term, complex and contested process involving vested interests, um, numerous different public and, and, and private factions, etc. And then also it, it raises questions that the single policy narrative, I think, um, is, is in danger of making assumptions about technology transfer 
and to, to draw from from Lyle, who was writing in the 19, he was writing in 1993. Um, he he warned against um, the failure to consider the difficulties of transplanting foreign technology into a country where adaptive institutions have not evolved jointly, and this can result in serious incongruities and disruptions. And a number of people in the talks yesterday gave examples of, of how this has happened in in various countries across the African continent. And so I think then um, such a perspective from Lyle poses a challenge to technology as a, a neutral and technical entity, but rather that something is relation that is relational and embedded within a specific context where, where it is eventually implemented. Um, so obviously when, when we're talking about Africa writ large, um, there's, there's a, a huge diversity, as I mentioned, but there's also key challenges, um, particularly from the perspective of the research that I've done in relation to electricity access. Um, and this diagram from the International en Energy Agency um, gives, gives a, a perspective on, on electricity access across the, across the continent. Um, I think that this was in 2014, so I think that access is actually increased in a number of countries, including Ethiopia, for example, but it, it gives an example, it gives a perspective on things and also um, illustrates the, some of the differentiation as well. Um, so coming back then to, to context counts, and I suppose this is my, my, um, my kind of headline message when you're thinking about sustainability transitions and the political economy of transitions. So first of all, um, uh, the historical perspective is important, context is perspective, and this context is important, um, and this can be dependent on numerous factors such as social, economic, political, geographical, linguistic, cultural, legal, technological, financial, fiscal, uh, GDP, uh, rural, urban population, access to electricity, etc. Um, and key questions, I suppose, that I have found useful to ask when thinking about context, when thinking about understanding the context and the, the context in which a transition could take place or is taking place. Um, what, so one question would be, what are the national, sub-national, um, local government structures and institutions? And these could be formal institutions such as uh, departments of energy, departments of trade and industry, finance ministries, but they could also be customary institutions as well. And we had um, some interesting examples of that yesterday in the talk on um, uh, mining in Ghana, for example. And then also what infrastructures and resources already exist. So these could be large scale electricity networks, they could be roads, ports, but they, they could also be smaller scale infrastructures or even lack of, even an absence of, of what, what might be considered an infrastructure. And then how may these infrastructures facilitate or obstruct a low carbon transition in, and in what way? And then what are the, the relevant regulatory frameworks? And um, I guess thinking about this in relation to some of the research I've done in South Africa, uh, what are the rules on who has the right to sell um, electricity or who has the right to generate electricity? These are, these are hugely deterministic over the way in which a, a transition can, can take place. Um, what national development plans already exist, so thinking of South Africa's case, um, the national development plan, the industrial policy action plan, the new growth path, and specifically in relation to renewable energy, um, the renewable energy independent power producers program. And then who are the vested interests in incumbent institutions and individuals, and what role do they play in posing obstacles to, to any low carbon transition? There's always incumbents at play, but uh, the nature of these incumbents um, can, can be very different depending on national context. But I'm thinking specifically of um, research I've done in relation to electricity planning in South Africa, where first of all, um, energy intensive industries and coal miners in 2011 had a very important role in, in the modeling process that then determined one minute. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Well, so I might have to cut my, cut my uh, talk short, but that's fine. Um, but anyway, so coming back to my, my research on um, electricity planning, vested interests played a, a very significant role in this. I was going to talk about the political economy of sustainability transitions, um, but my time has run out. So um, this is a photograph of Marx, who, um, although political economy can mean many things to many people, he could be considered the, the godfather of political economy or one of the people who came up, who, on whom 
many political analyses have drawn from. And this is Schumpeter. Um, and socio-technical transitions, the, lit, the academic perspective on socio-technical transitions uh, has Schumpeter as its, as in its conceptual heritage. So this, this is why I've included these, these two guys. Um, but I think I'll, as my one minute is up, I, I'll leave it with the, this beautiful photograph and, and hand over to the next person. Thank you.